Mr. Grant, uh, great to see you. Thanks for joining. You know, it's a little, it's a little bit of a uh, maybe danger to say, ask me anything. You know, so if we get relationship advice questions, man, I'm handing those, I'm handing those right over to you. You know, political, <laughs> religious questions. You know, we can, we'll maybe jump, jump into that. But no, we're here to talk about uh, food plots specifically, cover crops, and soil health. And, and really, Grant, that's that's what brings us together. Uh, you know, I remember a number of years ago when you stopped by the farm, and you know, I first met you. You know, we 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 shared that that common drive to regenerate God's creation. That's that's part of both of our mission statements, and and I think that's part of what makes us such a great partnership is that we're really aligned on the values of regenerating God's creation for future generations, and and that's both the land as well as the people, and and through that, you know, our communities as well. So we appreciate. Uh, you know, how you end all of your episodes with, you know, take time to get out into creation and most of all, take time to listen to the creator. So just really appreciate that. Yeah. And likewise, Keith, I've always really appreciated and valued your mission statement and how y'all conduct business and the ability to cooperate with someone where you have total trust and the good of all of us, users, us in mind is rare these days. And so this is a very comfortable relationship for all of us here at Growing Deer. And one we enjoy, right? Because who doesn't like playing in dirt and plant different things and seeing if deer eat them, don't eat them, or how the soil turns out. I mean, gosh, that's fun, man. That's, you know, I couldn't really design a better job description for me anyway. It, it is. And, and you know, I've been, to, I've been to your proving grounds a number of times. And it's just always impressive to me you know, I mean, the deer, the pictures of the deer, the deer that you harvest are impressive. But to me, it's not nearly as impressive as what you've done with that soil. Or <laughs> maybe I should say what you've done with your rocks. <laughs> because, you know, literally, folks, if you haven't been to Grant's place, you know, he's farming on a worn out old Ozark Mountain side hill. Uh, and you look at a lot of the stuff around there and that's still what it is. But he's built fantastic soil because he's following these principles of soil health, which the release process is built on. So as we go through these questions, we'll, we'll kind of bring in, uh, you know, some of the soil health principles. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, which of the principles is at work here and why some of these things are working. So uh, I think, I think we'll be able to, you know, interact and uh, spite, you know, splice in some of the concepts as we go through the question. So I guess if it's all right with you, Grant, I'm just going to I'm going to jump in and ask the first question. Most of these are going to be directed uh, to you, uh, but I'll certainly comment uh, on on any of them as we come. So the first question from Sean, uh, he's saying on a strict no till rotation, a summer and fall release blends, you know, should he be burning those plots to, to remove residue, you know, particularly the sun hemp, you know, it can make a pretty big, thick stock. You know, how often do these annual plots need to be burned? I, you know, you show a lot about burning perennials and getting rid of cedars and controlling brush. Do we need burning as a tool in the annual food plots? You know, I'm sure it's a case, but actually I want that soil covered. I want the duff on the ground. I call it duff, you know, residue, whatever, that dead plant material. That really, as you know, Keith, holds moisture in, keeps those soil temperatures in a moderate rate, both not too cold, not too hot. And is food and cover for all those beneficial microbes and insects that really drive the system you and I are really fond of. So I think some people worry about that, that question seems to stem from planting through there. And if you're broadcasting into a standing crop and then crimping or terminating somehow, that's just more cover for your seed. And if you're using a no-till drill, and I, I say this kind of jokingly, but if you're combing right next to your scalp, and your long hair is tangled, your comb still goes right next to the scalp. And that's the way a drill does under a really tall crop, even of tall sun hemp or something. So there's some cases, and we do burn off little small hideo plots in the back where we're not getting a tractor or drill, and there's duff and leaves from the surrounding oak trees, and whatnot. But our big plots, that's rarely, rarely a good option. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, in fact, somebody just asked me this question the other day about burning on annual plots. And I said, you know, there's there's three three main problems with burning on annuals. You know, on the perennials, that's a different story because you've got well-established root systems, properly timed. That's it, it encourages that stuff to come back quicker. With an annual, you've got to start over. 
So number one, you're just removing that residue, which can expose your soil to wind and water. So erosion is, is a big problem or a big issue there. Number two, generally, most of these plots, the things that they're the thing that they're shortest of is carbon. And when you burn, that smoke that you see go up is mostly carbon. And so you're losing a lot of carbon when you do that. And then number three, uh, if you get a hot enough fire, you will smoke a lot of your microbes in the biology. Uh, you know, and now it might just be in the in the top inch or two, uh, but it, that's still going to set things back. Uh, so I would agree with you. There may be certain issue or certain situations where you'd need to burn an annual plot, but I think it'd be pretty rare. Um, so yeah, figure out just how to get the seed to soil contact when going from one crop to another. So uh, great. If you don't mind, I'll add one last quick yeah. thing. That, you know, if you burn it and you turn it black, then you go broadcast the seed and it doesn't rain. You know, that soil temperature can literally get 140, 150 degrees or more when it's black. And that could actually harm or kill, terminate those young seeds. So if you're like uh, she got a little small hidey hole way in the background it filled up with oak leaves or whatever and use fire to clean that off there you want to broadcast those seeds white before right before rain excuse me or they're, they're probably going to get toasted out there yeah yeah that's right uh rick is asking uh about is, is there a negative uh what what would be wrong with planting the fall release in the spring he's he's got uh, a shorter growing season, uh, so he's wanting to just plant once, and it's drier in the fall. So can he plant that fall mix earlier in the spring and get it to work? What do you think about that? You know, that's probably not the best idea. A lot of those species in the fall uh, food plot mixes are designed to be planting with shorter day length. That's kind of how their nature works, and they might mature or make seed even before winter gets there. There's just, you're kind of going against the biology of some of the plants. And I think Keith could talk to this more than I can from his uh, cover crop side, but some people mix in both spring and fall seeds in one blend. That's not something we really promote or not for food plots, but that's a possibility and maybe a potential future blend for, you know, those way Northern food plot guys. Yeah, no, I would agree. And, you know, the, the the fall release all the whole fall series is primarily cool season species which you know can tolerate some heat but they can tolerate heat much better when they're young and then they're growing into shorter cooler days that's way better than when you plant them you know say you plant them in april they'll grow really well for a little while because you know they're shorter cooler days but now you're growing into longer hot days and what happens with the cereals uh, well, number one, you know, like things like rye, which is a true winter annual, it has to vernalize. It has to get cold enough to go somewhat dormant before it triggers that plant to give you its full growth. Right. And so if you don't have that cold snap, that cold period to trigger that uh, dormancy, the break that vernalization, then it will never grow properly. And things like oats that don't need to do that they're they're looking at growing degree days and so what we've seen when we plant oats in april or may they grow really really fast they don't get very tall because you have so many more growing degree days in june and july than what you'd have in september and october so they go through their life cycle much much quicker and they may only be half as tall before they're heading out uh you just don't get the growth you don't get uh you don't get the things to work so if you're really tight on growing season and i know there's a question in here about you know from wisconsin you know uh where the growing season is short there's probably some things you can do you may not have time to plant a full summer release and a full fall release there's probably some things you can do to plant your fall release a little earlier you know maybe mid-july because, you know, if you're further north and you plant mid-July, you know, it's not that long before your days start getting shorter, your evenings are cooler. I can see that working. You know, in the summertime, you might just consider just a quick crop of, you know, something like buckwheat. Uh, relatively cheap. You can plant that, let it grow for four or five weeks, either terminate it or if you got a lot of deer, they'll probably terminate that for you. <laughs> yeah. You can do something simpler, cheaper that that you know is only going to grow for four or five weeks and then transition over to your other one. So I, I would look at things like that rather than taking something that's designed for the cooler weather and trying to force it uh, through through the hot weather. 
Uh, well, here's here's a here's a really relevant question, Grant. We were talking earlier about how dry it is down in your area. We caught a little shower here today, so that really helped us. But man, we've been hearing from lots of people how dry it is out there in different areas. So JB uh, is saying, I live in the middle of the Sand Hills in Kansas. I've tried your fall mixes several times, but have had limited success. Only thing that seems to work in this sandy soil is straight rye. I parked the disc several years ago and used a crimper with good success. Drills in a seed, that those are all good things. Uh, we're very lucky to get any sufficient rain closer than four to six weeks apart. So here's this question. Do you, do we have any plans to work on a mix that is really drought resistant? Well, I'm going to really let you run with this, but I'm going to say uh, I'm not aware of any great forages that, you know, grow with no moisture. It just takes moisture to fill up those cells and make plants grow. Now, there are some that are more drought resistant than others. And that's really for Keith. Keith knows these plants much, much better than I do. And all the plants out there in all the different areas. But uh, yeah. I think you're doing a good thing about in those really tough soils. And I had one last thing. I have a lot of clients from real sandy soil with limited rain and they may plant cereal rye, never rye grass ropes for deer, cereal rye, a time or two and start building up some organic matter and improving those soils. Then when they do catch a rain, you can hold more moisture. Do you agree with that, Keith? Yeah, I, I do because you know there's a lot of factors in you know what we would call drought resistance. Some of it, some of it certainly is the genetics of the plant, but a lot of it has to do with the the biological interactions between the plant and all of your soil microbes. And and if you're in a sandy soil, you have very little biology out there. It's going to struggle because there's you know you don't have that biological interaction when we first started green cover back in 2009 the previous year we had done a, a set of experiments and trials with soil moisture probes in the soil and what we saw and and we've seen this repeated with other demonstrations other experiments is that the diverse mixes use moisture far more efficiently than anything did in monoculture and so what that tells us is that in a monoculture situation, it's a highly competitive environment because every plant is exactly the same. It's got the same root depth, same canopy height, same nutrient and water needs. It's, it's extremely competitive. But in a mixture of things, you know, now I have this rye plant, this pea plant, this, you know, buckwheat, this radish. Now, now we have different plants, different rooting depths, different canopy heights. So if you can get a mixture as established or growing, uh, it's going to be more moisture efficient. And then as you, like you said, as you build carbon, as you build residue, now when it does rain, you can hold more moisture. So, you know, that's one of the biggest problems with sand is it just simply doesn't have moisture holding capacity. But as you well know, Grant, as you build your organic matter levels and you've gone from, you know, what, probably one or 2% to seven or eight percent on some of your yeah. every percentage of organic matter holds another acre inch of water which is twenty seven thousand gallons and so just think about the water storage that you have now it has to rain in order to get that and you have to get it in the ground to get it but if you can't hold it nothing else really matters and so you know jb i, I would say that uh you know we we can certainly choose things, you know, like, like rye is very drought tolerant. Sorghum, you know, Milo would be one of the most drought tolerant of the summer species. You know, cow peas are really good uh, in that as well. We, we can choose things that are the most drought tolerant plants that we know of, uh, but that's only part of the equation. We got to get that soil, you know, building it up. We have to uh, get the biology out there and, uh, you know, just start creating that environment. Because those those you know soils were built over centuries uh, with these diverse prairie grasses growing out there, and so it can be done. It's just much slower in a dry, brittle environment like that. And and even even in areas you know Grant works in a lot of areas that traditionally get a lot of rainfall, and uh, they're they're hurting. What what do you see, Grant, in some of these areas that typically get a lot of rainfall, but now they haven't? Are they uh, how resilient are some of those? What are you seeing there? Yeah, you know, those folks like Chris Berry, whatever, that uh, have had at least three or four years of good rotations of diverse covers and building great soil, man, they, they slid through this drought so much better than their neighbors or than I even expected. The pictures Chris sends us are just shocking to me. And uh, 
so improving soil and hold, be, having your soil able to hold more water, like Keith says, and I think I first heard this from Keith many years ago, but it's not how much rain you get, it's how much you keep or how much infiltrated and stayed in your soil there in the root zone. And it's amazing what just 12 inches of rain a year can do on really good soil and how little 60 inches of rain will do on bad soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point. Uh, here's a good one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, how do you bring calcium back up to the root zone? Uh, should I be adding lime? Should I be doing tillage? Well, what should you be doing in this situation here? Well, let's don't till. That's not going to help us. So we can, I'll answer the easy one. I'll leave Keith the hard ones. Let's not do tillage. And I, and I, from a lot of deer hunters, I get a lot of questions about liquid calcium. And there's a lot of research on this, guys. And it could be used maybe to, for micro situations. But the bottom line is calcium is kind of heavy. So if you're really, you know, your pH is really, you know, getting down there pretty low. It's going to take some poundage, not gallons, to really turn that pH around. Don't, don't you agree, Keith? Yeah, it will. And, and you know, there is a there's it's true that you have to do tillage to get your calcium into the soil when you have no biological activity in your soil. So, you know, in a dead conventional system, yeah, that probably is needed. And that's where a lot of those recommendations come from. But if you've got earthworms, man, those earthworms, they're moving soil. They're they're distributing things, they're bringing things up, they're taking things down. If you've got any earthworm activity at all, I think you can spread lime on top and and they'll they'll get it worked in, they'll get it moving for you. And here's the other thing. I always I always remember this uh, again from our early days, probably the first 5 years of green cover, uh, you know, Ray Ward, Ward Laboratories, uh, mm -hmm. Grant, you're very familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, they're they're just 60 miles from us here. And so we've worked with Ray on on lots and lots of different projects. Well, uh, he has a farm uh, a couple hours away from us here. And so we he did an experiment one year and planted two cover crop mixes in the summer after wheat harvest. One was mostly grass mix, grass-based, the, the, the other things in it, but the majority grass. And another one that was a majority broad leaves. And then he... Then he uh, tested the, both the soil as well as the plant material from those two mixes. There was a significant difference in the calcium levels. The broadleaf plants, typically they have tap roots, deeper roots. They brought up lots more calcium than grasses did. So I guess one of the things, if you think you've got a lot of calcium that has leached too low, I would plant a heavy broadleaf mix, you know, things like sunflowers, you know, cow peas, things that have those deeper, big tap roots, the radishes uh, would be really good here. Go a little heavier with the broad leaves, let them bring that up. Now, you can't have, you can't have, you know, 50 headed deer out there. You know, I, I'm just amazed at some of the pictures that you send that not a single sunflower ever survives um, because they're great at bringing up some of those deeper nutrients. Uh, so, so heavier broad leaves and grasses will definitely help cycle that. Uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're real low on pH, uh, number one, stop putting nitrogen fertilizer on because that drives your pH down. And number two, you can add some lime and you do not have to till it in as long as you've got biological activity out there is what I would say. Keith, I think this might be a really great place just to interject if I may that you know, if you've been planting our blends and you're getting limited progress, you feel, please, 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 everyone out there, please have a utilization cage in every food plot, just a, you know, a basket that deer can't get their nose in and see how tall the crop's getting where they're not being browsed versus outside where there is browse. Because if your crops are what I call lip high, I mean, you know, from when you're planting to when the season's over, they still not got over an inch or two high, the roots never got much development either, and you're not going to get the benefit of someone who's getting a bit more growth. No. And if Keith has taught me it's okay to have a plant or two in your blends that aren't as palatable uh, so you can get those soil health benefits while you're attracting and feeding deer. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a fine line, you know, to, to walk between, yeah, we want to feed the deer, but we also want to feed the soil and 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 so you know that that is a bit of a fine line. What Grant? What percentage of the people who are planting food plots would you say have a utilization cage? 
way too low. I don't know. 10%, way less than 10%. 10% have them was a better way to say that. Even clients of mine that have become friends that I know and I kind of heckle a little bit about it. I don't know. I mean, folks, this is pretty easy construction to build a little cage out of something you got around. So, and they're the most valuable tools. And guys, I get like George to finally put one up, light bulbs go on. You know, they say, oh my gosh, I need to harvest some does or plant more acres of plots or, you know, I got to find a balance in here. Yeah. So I, I think they're one of the most important tools for food plot farmers there is. I would rank it up there or even over a soil test. I mean, they're just so important. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I mean, I've seen some of yours. It's just some chicken wire with some posts and, you know, you can use, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to put one together and, you know, so it's it's almost no cost and not a ton of effort, especially if you put the effort into making one, remember where you put it from here. Yeah. <laughs> so you can go out and utilize it again. You don't have to build a new one uh, yeah. every year. So, yeah, no, that's great. I'm uh, going to move to a little bit different subject here. David is asking, uh, this is a more of a uh, tree question. So he's seen your episodes about double girdle, hack and squirt and some of the newer herbicide mixtures to use. So his question is, uh, uh, well, let's see, you know, what, maybe talk about some of the new herbicide mixtures for the hack and squirt method, as well as the girdle and squirt. Uh, what he doesn't have a good hold on is when, you know, what month or what season is each technique most effective? Okay, well, just real briefly, the, the ratio that a really good friend of mine, Dr. Craig Harper, uh, Tennessee Martin University, come up with after a bunch of research, I'm grossly oversimplifying this, is 50% Garlon, G-A-R-L-O-N 3A, not Garlon 4, Garlon 3A, 40% water and 10% Arsenal AC. And none of these are really new chemistries, but the combination is relatively new. And you want to mix the Garlon and water than the Arsenal, because if you mix Arsenal and Garlon, then it make a gel and you can't really use it and you'll be all messy. So, and then Hack and squirt is simply making an incision with a hatchet or machete or something into the tree's cambium or tree circulatory system and putting just a small amount, one trigger milliliter of that herbicide in the tree, one hack for each three inches diameter. And that works best on most tree species when the leaves are fully formed. So let's call it June, whatever, depending on where you are, until the species of the trees you want to control, those leaves start changing colors. In other words, the sap is not moving the same, right? And girdle and squirt is just simply taking a chainsaw. I got a really light steel electrical saw. The battery lasts a long time because I'm not making firewood. I'm just cutting through the bark. So you're not working that saw very hard. And making a girdle around tree, it doesn't have to hit exactly, but they have to overlap. So there's nowhere where the circulatory system has not been damaged. And then you squirt that full, not full, just barely missed it in there of that same recipe. And girdle and squirt works year round, you know, dormant, warm. And one last thing I'll say about that is, great question. This is not like spraying a tuft of grass in your wife's flower garden with Roundup. You're spraying a fair amount of product for you know a few ounces of a plant. With garden short hack and squirt, you may be terminating something that weighs a ton or more with a couple of milliliters. So oftentimes it's weeks, months, or even the following spring green up before you see that tree you know dropping leaves and obviously in the dying process. Yeah. So you got to exercise a little patience when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back, uh, Sean's asking a question here, kind of a follow up to what we were talking about before with uh, balancing building soil versus growing deer. And he says, is, is that the case with sun hemp? Uh, he had uh, his summer release had 10 foot tall sun hemp, which we, you know, we've seen some pictures of that. He could find no sign of deer browsing in it, whereas they were eating the other components of the summer blend. Uh, sun hemp is one of those things that some people love it. Some people don't like it because it gets so tall on them. Uh, well, I, well, first of all, talk a little bit about, you know, deer, do deer eat it? And number two, if he's got 10 foot tall sun hemp, what do you think's happening out there? So I think that's just about the same as radishes or turnips, if you will, common term. Uh, some places deer love them. Some places deer don't touch them. Deer are what I call concentrate select feeders. Actually, a lot of scientists use this term. I didn't come up with it. Which basically means they eat the best in their range and ignore the rest. They eat the best. They don't get bored like we do. Boy, I don't want McDonald's again tonight. You know, they eat the best and ignore the rest. So in your area, if you had a pretty good crop, then sun might be lower 
on that preference pole and it's allowed to grow more and do more work in the soil, pump more nitrogen and all that. In other places, I see a most sun hemp off. So uh, it's a good component. When it gets so tall, it can be a pain. And Keith has been working on some maybe alternatives for that. Uh, but it has served a great purpose in our blends. And at my place, it's even different. Some years, boy, I mean, Keith's been here. They mow sun hemp leaves as high as they can eat. By the way, folks, those leaves generally test out about the same as alfalfa. It's pretty high quality forage. And in other years, when I've got a lot of really high quality forage, I'm like you, I don't know, are they eating this stuff? They're not eating this stuff. But I know in the back of my mind, it's always helping the soil. So I'm okay with it. And I, I too wish it wasn't 10 feet tall. But I think he's working on something for us there. Yeah, so there there is a plant called mini sun hemp, <clears throat> mini red sun hemp. We had it in our plots this year. Uh, in And, you know, it'll it may still get six feet tall, you know, at full maturity, but it it looks like it's leafier. And and so the deer are never going to eat the sun hemp stem, but they're going to browse those leaves off. And so what happens, I think, is if they don't get out there and start browsing those leaves early and that plant has 100% of its leaves, I mean, that is a photosynthetic machine and that thing takes off and really grows, really grows. But if they're if they're pinching a lot of those leaves off early, then that sun hemp plant has to grow new leaves before it can photosynthesize. And it just, it really slows the whole process down. So if, if they're out there early browsing on it, it's going to stay shorter. Whereas if, like Grant said, if they're getting those, the nutrition that's in those leaves from other sources and they're not hitting on that, that, that plant just takes off and wants to go. So <clears throat> we had this mini sun hemp ordered last year. It's grown in Thailand, which is a long, long ways away. And, you know, if you watch the news, you know how much of an issue shipping is. And especially, you know, that really needs to come through the Suez Canal. Well, that's where those Houthi pirates are holding up a lot of these ships. It, it just simply was not logistically possible to get that load of sun hemp into the country this year. So we're working on it. We're working on it now for even next summer because it just takes that long. You can't grow these things successfully for seed here and uh in in the states and so we have to get that imported from other places so that that just gives you a little bit of an indication but yes even when it gets that tall uh it's doing great things for the soil it's a legume so it's putting nitrogen in the soil but it's also got a lot of carbon in that stock <clears throat> and you know if you have a, a roller crimper and you can knock that down it's going to provide a lot of long lasting <laughs> cover mm -hmm. residue for your soil if you don't have a crimper you know uh just find something to drag across that lean it over knock it down the best that you can i don't know that i would try to mow it yeah that that could get ugly uh trying to mow 10 foot tall sun hemp because it could really wrap up on your mower and stuff it's better to just kind of try to knock it over somehow grant have you successfully rolled down tall sun hemp well, you have to wait pretty late, right? Because it stays viable. And the crimper only terminates plants in that flowering or so stage, right? But what we have done, Keith, is mow it. And don't, you know, don't give me nasty looks here, Keith. And we set our deck a little higher because if you mow it short, that sun hemp stop can be stout and you might get a flat on your tractor. So no one likes that. So we set our deck so when a tire hits it, it's just rolling it over. It's not getting on top of it anyway. So like two feet high. Yeah, or you know, a foot and a half, something like that. And yeah. as food plotters don't have as big attractors as Keith has, but anyway. <laughs> uh, That's fair. And, and, and if you, and also I find if you mow it higher, it doesn't tend to wad up. We've had zero issues versus if you're mowing a number six inch or something, that could be an issue. But if you mow it higher for whatever, I don't understand the physics here, but we've not had any of those issues. But you yeah. mean the plant first, folks, whether you're broadcasting or drilling, plant first, because you put all that tonnage on the ground, it's going to be really tough for the seeds to get contact with soil. So you plant first and then mow if you're going to use that option. Yeah, if you're going to broadcast, always do that before, whether you're mowing, whether you're roller crimping, whatever it is, because that's the best chance to get that seed uh, down to the ground for sure. So, uh, okay, great. So here's here's a good question. This will be a fun one. Uh, Tim is asking if we can explain how and when each seed in the fall release germinates and when they come out of the ground. How do they provide quality food through March of next year? Um, you know, do some germinate and go dormant? So let's, 
and, and I don't know that we have to talk about every single thing. Let's talk about families of seed that's in the fall release, the super fall. You know, why do we have the different things in there? Some of them are better early, some of them over winter, some of them don't. Let's just spend a little bit of time talking about uh, that because we spend a lot of time talking about what should go in there and what quantities, what ratios, because each plant does have a purpose. It does. And Keith and Colton and Zach and I, and even others at times will have these big conference calls or in person, we got all kinds of spreadsheets and stuff. Well, if we do this or do we need a half pound of this, it's, it's not just, Hey, we got some seed here, folks. It's a lot. It's a, it's a brain game for a while. Um, so let, I'll start off with just small grains, which are grasses, wheat, rye, oats are the common ones that everyone's familiar with. And they're a pretty hardy seed. I like to say, boy, put a little moisture in the back of your pickup, they're germinate, they're die after a while, but they're germinate and grow. And those are a good basis for food plots because you can count on them. They're pretty drought hardy. We talked about that earlier. They're going to grow. Uh, deer kind of have a little bit of a preference. That's why you see us having a bunch of different stuff and blends. They tend to eat the oats first. And, and, and then the wheat and then the seal rye, but the seal rye, while we have it in there is really cold hardy. So man, when it gets wicked cold for any of us, you know, north of the coastline here, that rye grows down to what, 28, 30 degrees at once it's established and it's green as a gourd and doing good. And those deer are going to be nailing it. And it also has a big root system and a lot of cover to crimp and stuff like that. So again, every plant has a design or a purpose and that's kind of small grains then we have legumes, deer love legumes, almost all legumes I can think of, and they make nitrogen for the next crop. Uh, so we're gonna have some clovers or alfalfa, depending on what you buy and where you live, your mission, stuff like that. Uh, we may have something that's not gonna make it through like sunflowers, I get a lot of questions, why would anyone put sunflowers in a fall blend? Well, we know they're never gonna make a seed head folks, but they're relatively inexpensive, keeps the price down and deer love sunflowers. So, man, if we can put, and it's a big seed, so it germinates quickly, pretty drought hardy. So we can put some sunflowers in there, just a couple of pounds, and get deer head down on your food plot right in front of the hunter, right off the bat. Who doesn't like that? So, again, there's a purpose for all these, and I like Keith saying the families, all these different groups of plant. And then within the groups, we work on what? oats may freeze out up north or something. How many pounds of oats do we want in there versus wheat? Always a beardless wheat, you know. And, and cereal rye, there's a lot that goes in these blends. It's not just, and that's where Keith and his team are so strong because, and I'm, not, I don't, I'm sure I'm not supposed to say anything, but, you know, they deal with enough cover crop seed to plant, you know, the western third of America or something like that. I don't know how many acres it is, but it's a bunch. So uh, the facilities are huge. And so they have all this experience from the production ag side that we food plotters get to take advantage of. And that's, that's what, that's a huge attraction to me. Yeah, well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll ship 30 million, 35 million pounds of seed out every year, you know, so we're covering, you know, probably close to a million acres, you know, give or take, it's a little hard to know, but yeah, we, we cover a lot of area. So we get to, and then it's all over, you're right, you know, we, we get to see a lot of different situations and, and you're exactly right, you know, the diversity is out there for a reason. And, and like you said, with the summer release, it's the same with the fall ones, you can plant the exact same mix, exactly the same time every single year, and it will look like a different mix every year because you have different weather conditions. Sometimes your soil is going to be different. And that diversity, you know, resilience comes from diversity, and you need re resilience because you don't know what the weather conditions are going to be like. Is it going to be really wet? Is it going to be really dry? Uh, you know, did you, you know, and, and you'll see even within your field, you'll have different things expressing here that weren't over here. Well, that's telling you something. Now, what is it telling you? We're not sure. It's it's a little hard to know, you know, but it's probably telling you something about compaction, probably telling you something about the the, the mineral or the nutrient composition of that soil. Uh, it may tell you, you know, you may you may see deer browsing some areas of a food plot much harder than others because again, they've taken in nutrients differently because of the difference in soil conditions, the different biological interactions. There's so much we don't know. Uh, to me, that makes it super exciting because we're still learning a lot of different things. Now, we also have peas uh, in, in the fall release. And, and again, those that's a high protein 
uh, high nitrogen uh, type product. And then I think there's radishes in there. Yeah. You know, you know how much deer love the radishes and turnips and brassicas like that. So kind of a little bit of everything, but yeah, we definitely want it to overwinter uh, the, the rye, particularly because great weed control uh, and, and great forage, you know, it'll green up before anything else. And you're right. You know, rye will photosynthesize all the way down to 34 degrees, which is incredible. Nothing else does that. That's why yeah. it's green. And if you're 34 degrees, sun is shining, that rye is taking in carbon out of the atmosphere and it's putting it into the soil. So you're literally building your soil all year round. It's not slowing down. Well, it slows down, but it's not stopping. Uh, like, you know, like wheat kind of turn, tends to go brownish during the winter time. Oh, that means it's not going to photosynthesize till it wakes up and breaks dormancy. So different, different reasons for having different things. And I'll make one other comment here because I know somebody had a, had a great question because they saw, they actually read the seed label, Grant, because they said uh, on the seed label, it says Elbon rye with peas blend. What does that mean? <laughs> well, <clears throat> what that is, is we we work with a with a, a network of growers uh, across the country to grow a lot of our seed for us. You know, if we're selling 30 million pounds, that means we have to grow 30 million pounds. Actually, it means we probably have to grow 35 million pounds but because by the time we clean clean it and, you know, you have uh, stuff that you sift off, scalp off. So the best seed uh, is grown in regenerative environments, you know, no-till situation, uh, lots of diversity, you know, biologically active soils. And so this particular, you know, we, we had a grower, and in fact, he's not very far from us here in central Nebraska. He grew uh, Elbon rye and peas together and harvested them together. He's actually this certified, well, it could have been certified organic seed. He's an organic farmer, but those were grown together in the same field. He harvested them together. We cleaned them together. And then when we looked at it, it's like, well, why do we need to try to separate this? We're going to use both of these, the winter peas, the Elbon rye. We're going to use both of these in our fall release blend anyway. Let's just stick that in the bin, and then we'll just use that for these mixes. And so that's that's what that is, is it, those seeds were grown together. And what happens is when the seeds are grown together, and Dr. Christine Jones, if if you really want the the master's class in soil biology, plant-soil interaction, Go to our website, uh, go, go to our YouTube channel, uh, go to YouTube and search for Green Cover, Green Cover Seed, and look up the Christine Jones videos. I mean, she is amazingly smart and can really, really talk, uh, you know, explain it in ways that, you know, that us country boys can understand. Uh, and she really talks about how, you know, plants will work together with the microbes. And when you have a diversity of plants, you have more microbes out there. She, she told us something this summer, Grant. She was over here at our farm this summer. She said that one single seed can have up to 8 billion microbes in and on the seed. One wow. seed. Wow. And, and, and not just on the seed, but it's actually in the seed. Those microbes grow with the plant. And then when that plant is making seed, it brings those microbes out of the soil. And it's storing it right in the seed so that now when that seed gets planted... It takes in water, it starts to sprout those microbes that it needs to, to start, you know, accessing nutrients. They're right there. They don't have to go find them because they're bringing them with them. And when these plants are grown and they make seed in regenerative environments, particularly polyculture, multiple things growing together, they have more of those microbes with the seed. So if we could grow everything that way, that would be great. It's just hard. It's, it's hard to manage. You know, when you have all these different things together, this is one that we thought we could manage without separating. Uh, but that's why you see that on the tag is because those were grown in the same field, harvested together, cleaned together. And then we just we put them in the blend at the right uh, amount there. So but that's, I thought that was a great question. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's another anonymous attendee saying, does something special have to be done when broadcasting fall release into an existing summer release? He still has a fair amount of crimp ryegrass on the ground. I'm concerned the new seed will not make sufficient contact with the soil. How, how, it, how, do, how do we get that new seed to the ground? That's a great question, and you're wise to be concerned about that. So it is very important for that seed to make good contact with the soil. 
Ideally, it's down in the soil a little bit, but contact with the soil. And if you've got a thick mat from past crops, and it's been really dry this summer and it hadn't decomposed, or you haven't built up enough earthworms yet, because earthworms will help decompose that along with other critters. There's one thing you can do, and you gotta you got to get your timing right, but you can broadcast right before a sure enough good rain, uh, like an inch. Not not a toad strainer where you get three inches at once, right? Your seed's going to be the next county, but uh, a good solid rain, and that will get it more. It, raindrops fall about 30 miles per hour, so it's going to push some seed down. It's not going to push them all down, but create a really moist, favorable environment for that root to get into the soil. And that's our goal, right? So if, and it's not, still, at, even at that, it's not going to be a perfect stand because a perfect stand is where all the seeds are at the right depth, right contact with soil, right temperature, right soil moisture. So when I have those situations, I've done that myself. We'll probably do it this year because we're dry. And when we get rain, I'm going to be planting fast and heavy. Um, I'm going to plant another 10 or 20% per acre to help compensate for not all seeds making good contact soil. You know, you don't want to get caught on a, milo leaf or something where there's really no chance to get that root down to the soil so plant a little bit heavier and right before a good rain will help compensate for that situation yeah if if you're broadcasting into you know that thick mat or that you know all of that residue have you ever you know after broadcasting you know drug a harrow or just anything just drag it through there to just kind of shake everything because when you shake that it's going to help those seeds find their way down gravity is going to take them down you know have you seen anybody do that successfully just dragging an old harrow or bed spring or something i hear about that a lot i'm so opposed to soil disturbance that i to be honest i sold my last soil piece of equipment except a no-till drill and a crimper over 20 years ago i've been no-tilling for 20 years folks uh, and so um I'm sure that would work. I, I myself would would rather, if I could, you know, up my planting rate a little bit and wait on that rain. And another thing about waiting on rain, folks, you're, if it's dry, the seed's not growing anyway, right? It's just sitting out there, reducing its viability day after day for a lot of reasons, or getting consumed by a squirrel or rodent or a bird or something. So, but yeah, that would work. And yeah. lot. And a lot of this, we don't know, Keith, is scales. Are we talking a quarter acre food plot or you know a ten acre food plot? So. You got to be realistic in this and use your management situation for for what you're dealing with. And I think Keith and I would both agree the release process for Jenny Vag takes a bit more thinking or management than just disking and planting. Yeah. But the results, like at my place, folks, I'm not adding any lime fertilizer, very, very little herbicide. Um, and to put it in scale, I'm, I'm split by county line. Counties are pretty big in Missouri. Stone, that's how rocky it is, Stone County and Taney County. And uh, our county record before we started doing all this was a 131. Now, not all deer registered, but back in the day, if you killed a big deer, you know, you want to brag about it a little bit. And and we have killed and, you know, had our hands on, not just estimating on camera, 170 inch deer. So, you know, our habitat work, our food crops are, you know, making a difference here. And that's what I'm going for. Not all 170 inch deer, but allowing deer to express their full potential. A healthy deer is what I'm after. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would agree with you that, you know, we don't want to see soil disturbance, but sometimes we can see some residue disturbance if you can do that. So what I would recommend, you know, is if it's a small plot, go out there, broadcast, and then, you know, find something, you know, an old bed spring or just anything. Hook it behind your ATV and, and do half of the field or do 30 feet. Don't do the whole thing because then you don't really know if it helped or yeah. it hurt or it made no difference. But do part of it because now you you just you just did an experiment, you know you just did a trial and now you can watch and see. Yeah, you know what I liked the way that worked. That wasn't that hard to do, and I think I got you know X better, uh, or you know seed twenty percent more seed here, but not here. And then you know just put a flag out there and and watch that. It's not that hard to do some of these experiments. You just have to kind of think through. Uh, well, what would happen if? Um, and, and then go do it, but don't do the whole thing or you don't ever learn because you can't see the difference uh, on that. Yes. Um, Logan has several questions here. This this is a, a really interesting one here. I'm interested in it because I really don't know the answer. He's asking, is cotton a preferred food source for deer in your opinion? I've gotten a lot of mixed answers about this. So I wanted your professional opinion. 
You know, I I was like I said, I was just working all across the South last week. Cotton's one crop that farmers never worry about deer damage. They just real. It's kind of thorny. If you've never been around corn, it's kind of thorny, sticky. It's not a real pleasant plant to go, you know, rub your hand up stock or something. So no, cotton's not. Now, some a lot of people feed maybe to very cotton seed meal, stuff like that deer, which can have issues because it can actually reduce the testosterone level in deer. So you don't want to be feeding that right for the rut or you could actually reduce the viability of some of your bucks out there. But cotton plants is just not an issue. And I remember early on in the summer, you know, that first version of summer release, I think we put some okra in there. Okra is in the cotton family. And and yeah, it turned out to not be very palatable. Now they'll they'll potentially eat the okra pods, uh, but that's a pretty small part of the plant, you know, overall. We pulled that out because, you know, it just wasn't accomplishing uh, the goals. He's also asking uh, a question about mineral. Uh, have you had experience with deer not using mineral sites, even though there are plenty of deer regularly traveling through the area? Do you think cattle blocks versus powdered mineral makes a difference? Uh, I don't think deer, deer consuming that, finding that by their nose. So I don't think powdered or cattle block. I think it'd be more to composition those blocks. A lot of cattle blocks, of course, have a, a, a water-based adhesive to hold it together, right? They squeeze that in the press. They make them squeeze it in the press. You have to look close, you can see the lines where they pressed it there. So it's going to be the content of it. One thing I will say, and I, the cattle guys have found the same way, if you have really diverse crops out there or really diverse natural habitat, deer, deer won't go to that salt much. And a lot of cattle farmers have really, you know, they may used to have a budget of two or three or $4,000 a year just for mineral for the cattle. They've cut that way down or even stopped it because they their cows are eating such diverse mixtures of plants. So, and just one last thing there, two major universities have done research about deer using minerals and does it increase antler size? Because really that's what the question is about. Everyone was bigger minerals and neither study has shown, shown adding minerals or supplemental minerals to make any difference in antler size. Hmm. It's a great thing to put out if you're not in a CWD zone, get pictures of deer, certainly when plants are growing really rapidly or have a lot of moisture content, deer are coming for the salt, not the other minerals necessarily, but salt. And you're, you're going to get pictures of deer there. Yeah, interesting. Now, I know in the cattle world, uh, we see pretty regularly that as soil health improves, the the plants are accumulating more minerals from the soil because the, the minerals are in the soil, but the plants can't get them without the biology. So as the biology in your soil improves, the plants will get more minerals. And then when the cattle eat that, they consume less free choice mineral because they're getting what they need from the plants. Do you see that with the deer also? I probably see it more because deer are more selective or picking plants, but based on what they need more than cattle, which are big grass eaters. So I think they can find those minerals even easier. And I'll share this with y'all. Queen Anne's lace is a, an invasive exotic, not real invasive, uh, not from America. And it's considered a weed everywhere. And I never, I never, never heard, never saw, never even knew deer ever touched it. And just by chance, buck I was after late summer, antlers starting to harden, deer needing calcium. And a buck I was after just happened right in front of a truck camera picture, walked up to a Queen Anne's lace and took two or three big leaves off there. And the next day, I went and pulled several leaves and sent them to Ward's lab right there to the next plant over. You know, tried to get same size, same height at the plant, all these things. And at that season, at that particular growth point of that plant, Queen Anne's lace is extremely high in calcium. And deer through photo infrarescence or reflection in their eyes and their nose and all these things, that buck knew that plant was really high in calcium. He had not read the books that deer don't eat Queen Anne's lace. And he was just, you know, nailing it because he needed calcium at that time. Well, that's deer to concentrate selectors and they try really hard to find what they need. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great point that it's important to plant these food plots, you know, like what we're talking about. But it's also important to have some areas where you just let native vegetation grow. Some of that may be weeds, what we call weeds. But there's going to be times when that's going to be a valuable food source or a valuable source of nutrition for the deer as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, don't don't get uh, don't get too uh, caught up or tied up in that. Uh, we got Robert asking a question. He says he rents the county no till drill. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, like a lot of counties, they probably don't maintain it very well. It's kind of wore out. 
doesn't get a lot of penetration, but it does kind of plant neat rows. Uh, is that worth it if it's not getting that very good penetration, or should he just broadcast? Yeah, Robert. Uh, I started out renting drills, but Trace and I couldn't afford a drill to start with. And uh, my land was literally so rocky. I, I remember so clearly. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, someone gave me some soybean seed. It was all orange because it was treated with neonics. I would never have that on my land now. But back in the day, you know. And I would plant by looking down and seeing those orange seeds in the road. They were literally laying on top of the soil. But I certainly got contact with the soil versus broadcasting where I may not have. So I do think what you're describing is better than broadcasting in a lot of situations. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And <clears throat> I, I've seen your soil. I would never rent you my drill. You know, you're a consultant <laughs> and everything. <laughs> it's hard on equipment, yeah. So it's no wonder some of these drills are pretty wore out going over some of those rocks. You know, we're here in Nebraska. The glaciers never made it here. You know, we've got really nice soils. The only rocks that are out there are the ones that man has put out there through you know, foundations, limestone <laughs> foundations or something. So we're, we're very fortunate, very blessed with that. Uh, we're thankful for that. So uh, we're kind of coming up on time here, but we, we do have uh, time for a few more here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Horace is asking a good question. Uh, because of the intense heat right now, he's asking, are there chances to damage seed viability when the food plot seed that they're ordering is in transit to them? You know, uh, especially, you know, when it leaves our, our our place and it gets on a truck and it goes to this warehouse and then it goes to that warehouse. And by the time they get it, is there a chance that that can be damaged uh, from the heat? I mean, you you know, you ship 30 million pounds a year, so you're infinitely more qualified than me to address that. But, I, I you know, as a practical person, seed's been shipped every year for a long time and I never hear of that. So, yeah, you run with that. Yeah, and and uh, Horace, that, that is a good question. It's certainly heat can damage seed for sure. Uh, you know, when the seed leaves our warehouses, you know, it's 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 not cold. We're not keeping it in cold storage, but it's probably you know in the eighties. Uh, to to really hurt the germination of seed, you you're going to have to exceed probably one thirty to one forty for an extended period of time. Typically heat itself isn't nearly as harmful as if it's heat combined with moisture mm -hmm. and that's almost always when we have when we have heat damaged seed it's always because somehow that seed got wet in the bin maybe it got harvested wet and put in there and it never dried out maybe somebody left the bin lid open or you know the roof leaked or something it's almost always heat that's caused from moisture and now that seed is starting to swell and things are starting, you know, the biology is starting to come alive. That's generally a dry heat isn't nearly as hard on seed. And so I don't know that we've ever really seen an issue with that. And, and, you know, you can store, you know, you can store seed in the desert Southwest under hot, hot, but dry conditions well, you know, they found seeds in Egypt that are, you know, centuries old and, and yeah. still because it's dry. But yeah. you go down to what, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, man, I would not want to keep seed very long down there because it's that it's that humidity combined with the heat that that really, really hurts things. And so I don't think, you know, even if it takes a week to get to you it's not collecting enough moisture in combination with the heat to, to really be an issue there. But, you know, certainly when you get it, put it, you know, put it under cover somewhere, keep it as shaded as possible. Uh, just, just have good ventilation, you know, make sure you have ventilation uh, to, you know, you know, you wouldn't want to put it inside of a Fonex type trailer, you know, where the heat builds up and then it can't escape. So just if you take care of it like that, I think you'll be okay. Well, Grant, do you have any questions for me? Hmm. Uh, Keith, I'll just say I've really I've learned so much from you through our years of our partnership and super blessed to have that partnership. So I think I will share with people uh, that Keith and I are oh, and Colton and Zach are always looking, I think maybe globally would be certainly many countries for better options, but they're 
is no magic bean. There's not one plant that's inexpensive and drought resistant, but grows with its feet wet and cold hardy, but, you know, can take the summer heat. And that's one really big reason I've always liked blends because you can cover more of those bases with different plants. And Keith has refined that approach way more than I would have ever got on my own. Yeah, it's always fun to, you know, we just had our summer field days here a few weeks ago and we've got a hundred and some different plots of things that we look at and are always evaluating. And, and you know, Grant, you're, I think every year that we've worked together, you've always got some sort of an experimental blend going. Some years it's like, that was a good idea, but you know what, that didn't work. <laughs> and then, you know, like last year we tried, you know, the Ashenomany and it's like, man, you know what? That seat's kind of expensive, but man, does it really work? We got to figure out how to find more of that. So, I would say that's a big success story. Want maybe that's a kind of a good story to close on. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, Ashenomini. Um, uh, it, it's American Joint Vetch is what it is, but Ashenomini is the scientific name because we're going to people are going to be able to see that in some of the more premium summer blends next year, but just talk briefly about that plant because it, it is an exciting uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. It's semi-tropical or tropical. It's expensive as Keith referenced. I had to nudge Keith a little bit to get him trying up there. And, and uh, but it's real slow to start. So you would not want it by itself. I mean, it's, it, you're going for the first three weeks, guys, where's all that seed I paid for? And then it kind of gets going slow and that's where the other species in the blend are coming on. But right now, even now we're, you know, we're almost in September. We, where I am, we've been hot and dry last week. We had a hundred plus degree heat index every day and deer are still head down. I've been sending Keith and Colton and Zach pictures. Look at this deer head down to my food plot and it's reaching below the Milo heads, eating some Milo too, but reaching below getting that ash and omni, which has just really impressed me on my, rough rocky soils we've had some of our best friends try it also keith and i and it's going great in a lot sandy soil my rocks you know some clay so we're going to certainly be incorporating more of that in the future again it's spicy so in some of the more premium blends but if you've got a lot i'm going to tell you right now if you've got a lot of deer and not a lot of acres of food plots my land's deep we're kind of limited where we can put food plots and you want to that deer expressing its full potential ashtami's in a lagoon it's high in protein pumping nitrogen soil and uh, Zach and Colton were here recently. We pulled up some plants, but kind of hurt me because I want the deer eating them. And the roots were, you know, we're nodulating, we're making nitrogen uh, in really harsh conditions. Uh, so yeah, I'm super impressed with that and super excited to work with the green cover crew to really tweak those blends and get that right where it's, you know, not too much because it is expensive, but just enough to cover our, the feed we want. And I will say confidently, I'm producing more pounds per acre with it in by far in harsh conditions than without. And it's done a great job of suppressing weeds because it gets kind of matty thick and it's really, I'm a fan. Yeah. And you know, and again, this is, it's so cool to be able to see the, the great diversity that God put into creation, you know, when he created all these plants, because the reason that it seems really slow at first, I'm convinced, is because it spends the first part of its life growing down. It's growing a root system. It's establishing itself. So when it gets hot, no problem. I've got deep roots. I'm pulling up that moisture. You know, I'm I'm I can handle it. And and we see other plants like that. You know, the the fixation clover blots a fixation yeah. clover is a little bit like that too. It's kind of a slow starter because it's growing a root system. And then when it takes off and goes, man, it it hits the afterburners and it really goes. And so you need some plants that take off and go really fast and aren't going to last till the end of the race. And then you need some that start slow so they can come on at the end. And that and again, that's the beauty of a diverse mix because you can get both. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're up against our time here. I want to respect everybody's time. I appreciate everybody who has logged on and listened and, and all the folks that will be watching this uh, on our YouTube channel uh, down the road. Uh, we hopefully provided some good information. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. Uh, we'll have to do this again. Grant, I enjoyed it a lot. I, yeah. I always learn a lot in visiting with you and, you know, from the comments and uh, comments that people make. And, and that might just be a little bit of a plug. If you aren't part of the, the Green Cover Food Plot Facebook group community, 
uh, reach out to us. We can get you added into there. That's a that's a great place to ask these questions, Grant. I know you're on there answering questions a lot. Colton and I chime in once in a while. <clears throat> but the beauty of that is that you have other food plotters helping to answer the questions because that's that's really where the deep knowledge is. It's the guys that are doing it. And so if you're not part of that community, reach out to us. We can get you connected there. You can ask your questions on there and let the community answer it because it, it really is uh, a community of people that that make it work and make it happen. So uh, it's fun to see those ones that have, you know, I don't know, six, eight different comments below it. There's really good community or interaction in a kind, polite way. Uh, yeah. It's it's one of the few, it's the only Facebook group I'm part of, and except our own, of course. And it's, you know, there's just no naughtiness there. A, we wouldn't allow it. And B, it's a really good group of people that care about deer and creation and plants. It's just really a comfortable group to be part of. And it's refreshing to go on social media and not get bogged down with all the yuck that's happening out there. There's there's plenty of that. This is just uh, for, you know, getting your questions answered and making comments. Don't be afraid to put on there, hey, look yeah. at this. I mean, I, I did this and wow, you know, this is great. And, you know, and people will go, oh, that looks great. And, you know, post pictures of the deer you harvest. That's what it's there for. So I uh, encourage you to join that if you haven't yet. Uh, we can certainly get you connected with that. So, Grant, thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for running things in the background. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we hope to do this again sometime soon. Enjoy creation, everyone. Yep. Good night.